So I'm extremely pleased that that Rene Doyon agreed to talk to us today. He's literally just back from French Guiana for the JWST launch. So Rene is the PI of the nearest instrument, which is the Canadian contribution to JWST. Uh, so he's been effectively the leader of the JWST effort in Canada, I would say. Um, but I know it's boring to hear about when you first met somebody a million years ago, but just to point out that Renee and I were both on the same pre PhD yeah. summer course in the UK. And uh, now we're both in Canada. So it's, it's a little weird, but we are, we both did our PhDs at the same time in different institutes. Uh, so I've known Renee for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and when JWST launch was successful, I thought, you know, it'd be good to start the new year with something very positive and, there's nobody better to talk about JWST than Rene. At plus, he was at the launch, so uh, so I'm very happy to introduce him and and hear all about JWST. So it's all yours, Rene. Okay, well, thank you, Doug, and uh, thank you for this uh, very kind invitation. And uh, uh, you know, I'm I, I mean, the, the, what I'm going to do I'm going to do today is very unusual. I've never I've never done this kind of colloquium in the in its, I mean, it could be a public talk. And um, I mean, this this story is very much about uh, uh, yeah yeah I went to Kuru, but I nearly you know I was very uh, close not to go. So I want to tell you that story. And um, so my title is obviously launch experience and and status of JWST. So I'm, I'm going to start by doing the reverse. I'm going to talk to about the status, which is quite frankly not to not to say much because yeah, I mean, you 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 you've all the, the, know the, the the story. The timing could not be uh, better than than, than now. Um, um, so uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, website called uh, Where is Web? And so this this, this is a screenshot of, uh, of about a, an hour ago, and it gives you you know where we are. We're about 80% on our way to L2. Uh, web is fully deployed, and um, quite frankly, that was breathtaking. You know the way this thing was so smooth. Uh, I could follow the details of the deployments uh, twice a day with the detailed shifts that are confidential, but I can tell you that there was nothing wrong. Everything went nominal. So uh, quite amazing achievement. And of course, we're not quite done. There's still a lot to do, but uh, at least this damn telescope is deployed and in, uh, in, in it's on its way, uh, on its way to, uh, to L2. And now we're just... Uh, uh, into the process of doing the cool down, which is a controlled cool down right now, where a lot of, 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 of attention is on MIRI. Uh, this is a very special instrument for contamination. And so there's a, a lot of thing going on in that. So uh, just a, uh, a slide to show uh, uh, this blog that uh, maybe some of you have, have followed that was updated almost weekly. And uh, there's one today just to tell you that uh, the next uh, few weeks, uh, the, this blog will be updated about every week. So there's still going to be lots of details given by, by the project. And that's one thing which was a bit of a surprise to us, uh, the way the project opened uh, the mock, uh, the Mission Operation Center in Baltimore to the public, which personally I was absolutely pleased with that. So you guys could see as many details as, 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 as we were getting on, on the fly. Of course, it was risky, but I guess when the project realized that things were going smoothly, that was the thing to do to do to do, and I, I think it was a good decision because it really engaged the public uh, into this 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 missions, and I, I think it will it will continue. So, what's next? Um, there's a nice article written by uh, my colleague Heidi Heimel, which is on the Science Working Group and uh, uh, working in Aura, and she wrote an article uh, on the uh, on the uh, planetary. Uh, uh, um, uh, website about the commissioning of the telescope. And there's a nice diagram summarizing uh, what will happen over the next six months. So, so this diagram just show, show, show it. Um, we're going to turn our instruments around the, uh, the 28th of this month, uh, FGS and NIRIS, uh, and then we'll start the actual uh, 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 captures of the, uh, the, 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 the very first image around uh, L plus, plus 50. And the guider will be very important for this for Doing the, uh, the 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 starting the the, the work from the sensing campaign, which will be quite quite long. It's going to be, it's going to be about two months, uh, but really the main activities for the science center will be pretty much at the end. It's going to be around L plus one hundred and fifty days that we're going to start doing the commissioning activity, testing all the instrument modes, 
Uh, it's going to be very intense periods around May-ish period. And that's also the time when the, uh, the very famous uh, early release observations will be taken. And that's a big secret. I don't even know what will be observed from Miris. Of course, I made some suggestions as to what we should observe. Uh, but right now, this is a big secret. Uh, nobody knows what will uh, will come out of this. But that's basically, so you can go to this website and to get a, this, this, this figure is a nice high level summary of uh, what will happen in the next, uh, uh, the next six months. So yeah, everything is going fine and we're very, very, very happy. So uh, let me give you a little bit of a history on, on the project to give some context as to how we got to this uh, very famous uh, Christmas day. Could you believe that this telescope decided to launch on Christmas day of, of this year? So uh, this is, go of course it goes back to 1989 when there was the very first discussions of uh, to have a successor to Hubble. Uh, of course, uh, Hubble launched in 1990 and very soon realized that we have a problem. Uh, uh, the first touristing missions, 1993, was a huge success, uh, which really changed Hubble, uh, well, for good, right? Uh, to fix its image quality. Then the mid-90s, the Dressler report in Stockman uh, that uh, was basically recommending to uh, develop a space observatory with an aperture of four meter or larger, optimized for spectroscopy over the wavelength range of one to five micron. And then this, uh, the Dan Golden, era, the ninth NASA administrator, which remember was his motto was uh, faster, better and cheaper, which everyone was very skeptical about and with good reasons. And uh, well, you remember what he did, you know, in front of the AS and, uh, you know, telling the astronomers, well, why, you know, you guys should be more ambitious and you should go for a, a bigger telescope, uh, six, seven meters. And he got a, a, an standing ovations at that AAS. So 2000, that's the uh, kickoff of uh, what is called at that time, the next generation space telescope. That's an eight meter telescope. And uh, 2001, that's the year I actually get in there. And I have to thank Marsha Riki, uh, the PI of Mia Canada, because at that time, um, Canada, its only contribution is actually the guider. And But we don't have a science instrument. We're providing modules inside NearCam, which are tunable filters. And tunable filters at that time in this instrument were very much machined to find laminar alpha emitters uh, to, for first light. And uh, well, Marsha phoned me up. I vividly remember it was November 2001. And she said, Renee, I know you have expertise in uh, infrared astronomy and instrumentations. And uh, uh, would you kindly join my team and with uh, industry in Canada to lead the tunable filter filter modules of near camp? I said, wow, that's uh, very exciting. And when when do we launch the telescope again? She said, well, current date is 2008. Oh, wow, that's really far down. But why not? Let's do this. Sounds very exciting. I guess I did not know what I was getting to. Um, but so then uh, a year after, in 2002, there's a, a, a big replan because, uh, well, in fact, that year, uh, we realized that this, this is too big. Uh, that telescope has to be descoped at 6.5 meters. And uh, the, the project manager at that time uh, made the point that, uh, well, the tubal filters are not a level one requirement. And so, and uh, there was also a design to make NearCam US only with all the ITAR issue, and uh, which was a good reason actually. And so there was a decision to actually get the uh, the tubal filter out. So um, our scientific contributions did not last very long. So at that time, John Hutchings is the PI of the of the project. He's leading the guider. I'm myself just a near camp member leading the tubal filter development. I said to John, well, John, you know, why don't we take the tubal filters and put them on the backside of HGS? Uh, at that time, it was two two channel filters, and we could do this. And we proposed that to CSA, and they said, "Yeah, sure." And NASA said, "Yeah, sure, as long as your priority is to deliver FGS." So this is how the tubal filter imager was was born. Okay, then uh, 2004, there's a, a mass crisis in JWST, and what I mean by a mass crisis, I mean not more than several tens of kilograms. And uh, really, at that time, the project manager, Phil Sablehouse, I'll come back to him, he's now deceased, but he, he made an incredible contribution to this project. He, he had to go through the big crisis, the, the funding crisis of JWST. But basically, Phil was not the biggest fans of TFI, and he was really threatening to kill the instrument altogether just to get the, the mass of it. And of course, we, we saw that coming. 
And uh, at some point, we decided to, uh, uh, you know, not wait for NASA to tell us that we were out. And we, uh, together with the science team in Comda, we came up with a simpler instrument, a single channel TFI. Uh, and uh, actually, at the end, the, 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 it was accepted as, well, I'll come back to this point. But anyhow, uh, then we get into the, the mid 2000s, and then we have issues, big technical issues with the, the etalon of the single channel instrument to a point where CSA is asking me really under the cover to work out a backup plan. And so this is where around 2008, where I work a lot with the science team, very much under the cover and my own, you know, going after quotations for how we could reconfigure TFI into a new instrument. And in fact, these problem became really an opportunity because we're basically eight years uh, uh, after the, the beginning of the project. And remind you, 2001, that's the year the very first transiting exoplanet was discovered. We were not planning to do transit spectroscopy at that time. Uh, and then we, we, we realized that, well, maybe we could reconfigure TFI to be an instrument that would be that would be that would, that would do something new. So ENS was was born the uh, this this mode to do transit spectroscopy that was very optimized for bright targets. Of course, the other science instruments have been adapted to do that too, but really NIRIS was uh, at least one of the modes where we could do that uh, quite uniquely. And of course, the slitless modes, which of course is not as efficient as near spec, but yet very complementary uh, uh, to, to near spec and uh, you know, in terms of redundancy mode, uh, very welcome. Anyhow. So uh, June 9, that's my big moment in this project. There's many big moments we can describe with JBC, but for me personally, that was June 9, 2011, when I presented that plan that to, to the science working group. And that was, of, of course, again, under the cover, nobody knew and that we were doing this. And um, that's the first time uh, I think uh, that the science working group had to vote whether to approve this. And uh, it was uh, unanimously approved uh, to reconfigure uh, nearest uh, TFI into nearest. At that time it was not named nearest, but I was not the end of it. That was quite a big year. We had to, uh, there was a lot of pressure from NASA to deliver the instrument. FGS was getting first into ISIM. So we had to deliver this distance this very, very quickly. So, but we did it on July 31st, 2012. Uh, FGS Nereus was on dock at, at, at NASA. And then the rest of it, the launch, big campaign test, and then finally launch. So that's the story. So now we're going back a few days before launch. And, uh, and in fact, uh, everything was planned for, uh, you know, have a, a Canadian de delegation to launch. Uh, CSA, the, including the, pre the CSA president, Lisa Campbell, uh, about five or six people, myself included. And, and then came Omicron. Uh, the, the pandemic, uh, everything was organized uh, by NASA to have a charter flight from Washington. And then NASA canceled that flight. And then because of government uh, 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 restrictions, then we got this email from Gilles Leclerc on uh, December 19, telling us that unfortunately um, uh, he had to cancel all sponsored uh, uh, travels to, to Kuru. That was a big disappointment. So, but then I realized, well, okay, I'm not a CSA employee and maybe I can go. And, uh, but then I, 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 a few days later, uh, the day after, after spending a whole afternoon, uh, I realized you know, so just to go to crew, I need to go through Paris. That's the only way to get there. Um, and over a whole afternoon, I have this, this, this website in front of me, which is a, a flight reservations. I, I just ready to do click. And at the end I said, no, I'm not going to do this. Um, I, for moral reasons, I mean, maybe it's not essential to go to a, a, a launch, and um, and you know, I don't want to get stuck there over Christmas. And um, so that's the email I sent to the science my science team. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we'll have to rely on our only Canadian there, uh, Begonia Villa, which you'll meet later. Uh, Begonia has been working with us since 2004, but she's not NASA since uh, 2012 after we delivered the instrument. Um, so I did not sleep all that much that night, um, but then the next morning, um, no, I uh, changed my mind. So at 9.30, I had made my reservations and this email I sent in the afternoon, I was at the uh, Dorval Airport in Montreal. I just had got my, uh, my uh, PC, negative PCR tests and uh, well, this is a picture of my, of my luggage. Um, I'm going to, to Kuro. So I just couldn't help it. So uh, 
Then arrive on uh, about a 20 hour, a long flight, two long flights from uh, first Paris and then uh, Cayenne, we arrived. So I just think that thing was already quite uh, inspiring, right? Uh, not quite the right payload there, but anyway, that was a nice uh, nice shot of the, uh, the Ion uh, uh, rocket in the, uh, in the Cayenne airport. Okay, so now we, uh, so this is Cayenne and uh, so Kuru is about an hour drive. Uh, so that not many astronomers actually going there. So, uh, and, and uh, after I decided to go to Kuru, uh, my colleague, Dave Aldridge from uh, 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 Honeywell, uh, Dave is the, has been the, uh, uh, the mechanical uh, engineer uh, leading the design of the instrument. But and, uh, since a few years, Dave is the project manager at Honeywell. And so I was uh, traveling with him and uh, we had made an arrangement also with a colleague on the SWIG, uh, uh, Mark McCochran, who uh, also uh, unexpectedly, uh, because of all these uh, people uh, not going to Europe, he, uh, to, to Kuru, he managed to, 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 uh, to find a flight to go. And he, he, uh, we made arrangement for him to pick, pick us up there. So um, as far as I can tell, there's, there were not many uh, the only astronomers from the science wing was myself, Mark McCochran, and uh, Eric Smith from uh, NASA headquarters, uh, and no other, and Pierre Fury, uh, the near spec PI. So an hour drive, and then we get to our, our hotel in uh, the Hotel Mercury, where most of the people were. were. So uh, uh, this is where most of the actions will take place after, uh, also at the launch for party. Okay, so now we're. Uh, uh, December 23rd, uh, at that point, we know that launch has been delayed. When I leave Montreal, the, the launch is actually on, on the 24th and my flight is always scheduled to leave on the 25th. But now I realize that uh, the, this thing is delayed, so I'm gonna have to change my flight. And that one was not easy. Over Christmas, changing flights, uh, I remember I'm not flying with NASA anymore. So I have, I'm, I'm on my own to do all my own reservations over Christmas. So that, that was some background activities I'm not gonna talk about, but uh, that was pretty stressful to find a way to get a flight back, but I, I managed to do it. Anyway, so we're now two days before launch. And uh, so the uh, L minus tool with a rollout uh, uh, day. Um, so this is a, a map of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Sound Spatial Guyane. So uh, this is the uh, the launch pad here too, uh, and uh, this is the uh, the BAF, the final assembly building where uh, Webb was integrated integrated with the rocket. Uh, but then uh, it has to leave that place and over you know about a few kilometers, uh, about three point five kilometers. So this is the rollout to the the launch pad, and we get to see this. So first we're going to go and see on this side. We never managed to get close to the the rocket. That's the way it is. Uh, but um, this is a picture of me uh, showing with the uh, Iron 5 rocket in the background. And then we're going to be moving now on, on the building. Um, I'm going to give you a movie. So this is where the, the Iron 5 will end up here. And uh, just a this little movie. It's noisy. Sorry about that. <laughs> so there it is so we we saw uh, from the other side we saw the rocket and now it's going to come out there very slowly and marching down all the way to the uh the, the the launch pad several several hours of that weather was not all that good so we're sitting on this this building and we got there first and so the original plan with the the number of vips going there there would be several groups you know uh, moving to that 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 roof one at a time one group at a time uh, but you know there was so many little, uh, few people going, so at the end there was only one group, and so I just to give you an idea. Um, so this is my buddy Dave Haldridge. Uh, so you can see uh, we were giving some uh, some hoodies because the weather was not all that good. So I'm going to give you an idea of uh, uh, the people, and there's not more than twenty people on this roof. <laughs> So, I'll show, so that guy here, I uh, don't know if you, you saw the uh, 29 Days on Edge, that Greg Robinson's, the web program director at NASA. And uh, right here, sorry, again, at the end, this is uh, Bill Oaks, the uh, project manager of the whole uh, observatory. 
Yeah, Bill here. So actually, just for the, the, the story, my, my, my spot was actually there. But then the NASA crowd arrived later. And, and Bill is such a humble guy. He was just at the end on the backside and you know, setting up his camera and, uh, you know, to set up. And uh, I realized, OK, I went to him, look, Bill, why don't you take my, my, my spot? He said, are you sure that's OK? Yes, that's OK. So I give my spot to, uh, to, to Bill and he could uh, watch the, uh, the rollout. So that's one of the pictures you can see. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, high end is moving very slowly, 3.5 kilometers an hour. That's undoubtedly the slowest speed that the rocket went. Uh, and uh, one of these happy faces that you're going to see uh, on that. So that was pre pretty much our day uh, to see the, uh, the rollout. So then we went to see our, our friend, Begonia. Uh, this is when we got this uh, picture, the only three Canadians uh, on site. Uh, so again, Begonia uh, has been on our project for back in 2004. She's been, uh, she's an astronomer by training uh, and uh, um, Spanish or origin. She's actually featured in the, uh, the, this, uh, this video, 29 Days on Edge. And uh, yeah, I mean, Begonia has been an incredible uh, person in, in, for the project. And she's so good that after we delivered the instrument in 2011, uh, 12, um, NASA decided to hire her. So she's been on the project uh, since then, but she's still in our team and has FGS and Miris close to, to her heart, of course. So that was at her hotel close to the, the beach uh, um, uh, uh, just after the end of the, the rollout. And then we went to the, the hotel for the uh, dinner. So just to show you that uh, Ion Space knows how to receive. Uh, so it was very strange to see, to be in this, you know, close to a jungle and, in, uh, you know, you could believe you'd be in Paris. Uh, so we're very, very, very strange. That was my first trip to French Guiana. So uh, we were very well fed, as you can see. So that was a nice uh, place. And the uh, uh, very few people. I mean, we were, you know, sitting very close to the the big VIPs, uh, Thomas uh, 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 Sorbertson from NASA, and uh, and all the big cheeses were very close to us. Okay, now uh, L minus one. So the uh, more site visit. So uh, so now we're going to be going to the uh, the uh, the Jupiter Center. This is where most of the actions are for the for the launch. Uh, and there's also a, a, a launch site. There's also another one, the, a launch site called IBIS here, which my understanding, this is where we would have been uh, slated to go to watch. But there's another viewing site on, on 25 here. Uh, it's the Tucan site, and you'll see later, that's the closest site you can go. And, and this map does not really capture the scale, but uh, this one is much closer. It's five kilometers compared to 12 kilometers for, for Jupiter. So. Uh, you can guess that David and I decided to try to get a place. And uh, the lady at NASA organizing all this was really kind to uh, get us a seat to, to, to go at, on the Tucan site to, to see the launch. But first, let's see, you know, see, you can see how it looks like. Yeah, there's a, a full-scale model of Orion, quite impressive on itself just to see this. And so this is a, a picture from me, you can see it. And uh, this little video just uh, give you a sense of scale. Uh, this is huge thing. Yeah, so I suppose I'm going to get to a, a, a full scale model of the uh, variant five. Inside, just to give you an idea of this uh, big uh, auditorium that you've seen on the on the uh, on TVs. This is where most people are. Uh, the very famous fishbowl, where the uh, and this is uh, where the media briefing is is, is done. And uh, so for the launch, uh, the way it works is that two minutes before, sorry, two minutes before launch, so people just gather out into a terrace to, to see the launch. And that's, you know, the kind of view that you have 12 kilometers away. Um, so um, yeah, on a clear day. Okay, um, so now uh, we're gonna be going closer now to the, uh, uh, the site, to the, this place here called the, uh, the Ariane Vega launch. So the way you can see it, that uh, the the Vega launch is kind of being on the cockpit of the uh, 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 of the airplane, and Jupiter is kind of the uh, the uh, the uh, tour de control of the of the airport. So uh, 
this is basically a big bunker where uh, in case something goes wrong with the rocket exploding. And uh, so it's, it's, it's meant to be uh, uh, to receive, uh, to be, uh, you know, safe for uh, major debris to explode there. So I wish just a big quick visit there to see. And that's as close as we, we got to the, uh, to, to the rocket. So this is the Vega Ion uh, uh, Center. Uh, just a, a view inside uh, about the control room. So no windows. It's a bunker. Two rows of seats, same level, though, far, uh, on the far end. Uh, the next one seems they're going to be responsible. And we have this guy just uh, giving us a, a tour of the uh, of the place. Then we got to, to go outside to the last peak of the uh, of the rocket. Uh, we are about one kilometer ish away now from uh, from the from the rocket. Uh, a little video. Last time, got to see this rocket on this planet. Okay. So, uh, so pictures uh, not from me. Uh, I could we could not get that close, of course. But uh, these are shots taken uh, on site, and uh, uh, and there's a another nice one. Uh, oh, just for to, for the record, when we did the rollout, and uh, at some point uh, where the, the we were seeing a, an helicopter going around, and I said, oh, okay, there's some, some security reasons there to 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 do this, and then I heard, that, no, 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 it's not security. There were some VVIPs in that. Uh, Copter to to see uh, Ion uh, very close, so uh, we can guess who who that was. Anyhow, okay, so launch day, big day. Um, I did not sleep very well the day before uh, because I was just trying to get my a new flight. I, I, I the one that was not working out, and I did not sleep very well. But which is a good thing because just the day before launch, then I slept very well that day, and we but we had to wake up pretty early. Um, so uh, that's uh, me getting ready, of course, with the uh, upper red socks, my gears, um, and uh, and then we uh, at six thirty, it's drizzling, and uh, and uh, we are at the Jupiter Center, and uh, we have to take a PCR test. So again, uh, Arian Space was very well organized. They had all organized the the PCR test for everybody out there. And the bulk of them was done before for the NASA crowd because the NASA crowd was leaving on the 25th, the day of launch. So we're launches at the morning, 9.20 local time. And then their flight is something in the afternoon, somewhere in the afternoon. So people uh, took their uh, PCR test uh, on the 24th. But for us, uh, myself, Dave, and Mark McCarkin, who were leaving more on the, uh, on the 26th and the 27th, um, then we, we need we need to test uh, closer. So uh, Ian really accommodated us. There were actually two nurses at six thirty in the morning right there for us. Only the three of us to get their our PCR tests. Now I'll come back to this. It was okay for Mark and, and Dave. They got their tests eight hours later, but I did not get mine, and I was a little bit in a panic. I'll come back to this. Anyhow, so now we're getting to the bus uh, on our way to uh, to Cannes, and uh, just before leaving the. Uh, they gave us this uh, this mask. Uh, it's just in case something goes wrong, and you're, you're like in, in in the airplane. They they they're just you know teaching you how to to use this mask in, in case something goes wrong with launch, and you need to, to wear those things. But I'm showing the, this leaflet because it, it, there's a better scale about the uh, there's a you, you get a better sense of the scale here for the for the site, and uh, so you can see this is a Jupiter here and and Toucan, and there's another site Egami. I'm not sure where there were people there. Uh, but we were actually 120 on that side. And you can see here the scale. So we are 5.1 kilometers uh, as close as you can be from the, uh, from, from the launch. Okay, so this is the actual site. And so when we arrive there, so you can see this big screen. So Michelle Pfeiffer, the NASA TV is on already. So we have all, uh, the, all the information that you guys get from uh, uh, remotely and of course being on Jupiter. So you get the best basically here. You, you, you have the best viewing site and you get all the information and you don't, you don't see it on this side here, but it's nice espresso machines. You can get nice coffees, drinks. Um, you know, again, Ion Space knows how to receive people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go outside and give you a view of the, uh, uh, from outside, a little video, just to give you an idea where we were to, to see the, the launch. Welcome to Dave, for a big gold hamster. Dave so waving at me. Looking at it, 
so the model here that we have is the right of uh, full scale single segment. So that's it. This is maybe uh, uh, an hour before launch, and uh, and finally, this is it. So this is the this is what you saw from NASA Point TV. Um, I didn't have time to cut it, so I'll have to bear with me uh, and watch that logo. CSA standing by for terminal. He's uh, NASA. attention for the final. This. Neuf, huit, sept, six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, unité, top. Seven more seconds. And we have engine start. And lift off. Décollage. Décollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight. Good pitch program reported. Okay. Yeah, so we, we've heard that word a lot, nominal. So the uh, the, tra the trajectory is nominal. Uh, we've heard that a lot in the, 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 the next. So the, the next one is is my video. Now you we are back in Tucan and so uh, on my right is uh, uh, is um, Dave Aldridge. Uh, sorry, Mark McCorkran is uh, is filming with me, and uh, just next to Mark is uh, Dave, and uh, we're just uh, waiting. So uh, it's about a minute, and uh, you'll see the atmosphere is somewhat different here. <laughs> The clouds will not clear off, so you'll have to give up. So this is it. This this is an incredible moment, and I I've never had this kind of a, emotion in my life, which is I I know how to describe it. it it's a kind of a mixture of uh, you know. Uh, shouting uh, like after a big goal in the Stanley Cup uh, 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 final with the Habs and at, at, at the same time crying. So that's basically how it came out of me. But that was an incredible moment. And uh, of course, that was not the end of it. Uh, uh, we had the, uh, this, uh, of course, the, the, everybody gathered inside and uh, just like you guys were watching that on TV, probably watching out the, uh, the flight, the, the, uh, the, the launch until this magic moment when the uh, the, the, the uh, web uh, disconnected from the rocket. And we knew that there was uh, this camera on board that, and we would see uh, Webb say goodbye. Um, but we that was quite unexpected that we could see the uh, solar panel deployed at, at the same time. So it, it, the, the whole sequence, uh, the, the, the actual visual from the uh, uh, Ion uh, camera uh, was three minutes. So uh, uh, it was remastered after that. And uh, so what I propose to you is just to show you the, the three minutes uh, and it's actually with some beautiful music, which I'm sure many of you will recognize.
So this was uh, absolutely magical. And uh, I did not record that one. And I, I prefer just to watch it and just to give you an idea of the, uh, the, the feeling around. So there was a mixture of people cheering up and, and people crying like me. It was just amazing just to, to see this, this old friend uh, say goodbye, even, you know, wink at us on his way home uh, for, you know, yeah, uh, uh, waltzing at, at L2 was just amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of 2001 Space Odyssey. So that video really resonated to me. And it's only recently that I realized, geez, I started this project in 2001. So that was a great moment. Okay, so I, I just opened a, a parenthesis that just after launch, we got an email from Bill Oaks, the widespread to the whole uh, project uh, uh, to mention this little uh, uh, memory here. It's on the uh, on the spacecraft side in memory of Phil Sibelhaus, uh, Phil, who was the, the project manager uh, during the very intense periods of the projects in uh, and then Phil uh, uh, died early in his life. And, um, and there's, there's a tight connections between Phil and the Canadian instrument, which related to the, the mass crisis uh, problem that I described before. So I, I have to say for quite a while, Phil Sibelhaus was not our best friend. Uh, he really threatened to kill TFI and to a point where I vividly remember uh, we were summoned by NASA and a meeting at NASA headquarters, and we know what's coming up, and they, they will announce us that they will kill TFI. Of course, we saw that coming, and with the science team and ComDev, uh, it took us a few weeks to come up with a, an alternative design to turn our two-channel design into a single-channel design. And there was several reasons for doing this. First, simplify the instrument, and it turns out we could maintain the science. But you know what we wanted to do was to save mass. And um, so we go to NASA headquarters, where I think December 2004 there. And, um, and uh, we go down, uh, John is there, John Hutchings, um, Dave Kendall from CSA, now retired. And Dave was actually critical there because he started the pitch. Uh, he did not let Phil talk to us. So we took the lead to talk to tell him. And they said with, in this very smooth way, you know, how can we work in NASA to solve this mass crisis? And uh, we actually have a solution for you. We, have, we now came up with a, <clears throat> a new design, a new single channel design to have a, a lighter TFI. So I presented that and Neil Rollins from Comdev was there too. And, um, and then Phil at the end, Phil was a pretty crusty guy. And uh, at the end of the meeting, he looked at us and said, okay, guys, you can keep TFI in the single channel, but just promise me that your priority is FTS. So I, I think that day, uh, you know, TFI nearly died. The, the Canadian science team nearly died. And that's because, well, first us, you know, trying to try to survive, but that was really Phil's decisions to, to keep us going. So I, I find it really moving to think that uh, Phil is, is uh, riding a ride with, uh, with Nereus on, on our way to, to L2. And of course, there's also this, uh, this little plaque one, uh, this, this little uh, dedicates to the, the the whole team who was involved. You know who you are. Yeah, there's people who just watched that that you you're just like me having a right to L two, and um, we won't have time to discuss that now. But uh, let's ask ourselves when will be the next time that the CSA logo it's next to ESA and NASA. Um, so um, yeah, that's um, a big question. Okay, back to her. So uh, this is done. We have to go uh, back to the, uh, to, on the bus, uh, back to Jupiter. So uh, another picture to, uh, to uh, happy faces again. And uh, uh, just before going on the bus, a little message to, to the science team. Hey, that was absolutely fantastic. So I just want to thank you all. And I wish you could be here with me and Dave. That was absolutely awesome. So that's just the beginning. So uh, I hope to see you very soon. Joyeux Noël. Bye-bye tout le monde. Okay, so back to Jupiter. So on my way back, I have a, a my uh, my a phone call from Radio Canada. They want a, a radio interview, so we we set up there. So uh, Dave is my cameraman with my cell phone. So I, I do a, a TV live interview for Radio Canada, and then we got our, our again our shot together. This time with the, the three of us with our official polo. 
Uh, and you can see that we're respecting sanity measures uh, inside with the, the mask and everything. Uh, so another nice moment. And then uh, on our way back uh, uh, to the hotel where the, that was the party, um, uh, this picture on the, on the left of me is Laura Betts. The, Laura Betts is an outreach officer. She's an astronomer working at Goddard to whom I've interacted so with so many years over emails, but never had a chance to meet her. And so this was at launch that I managed to, to see her. And that was the case for many other people. On the Tucan side, I uh, was, uh, you know, this guy behind me, behind me, this Italian from North Grumman's uh, working on the Sun Shield. Uh, it was so nice to see all these 10,000 people that you don't know, but have, have been so important to the project. Uh, so yeah, a little bubble here. And of course, uh, lunchtime. So this, that was our menu, no turkey. Uh, so you may wonder why the hell I'm showing Thomas or Britton on this next to this menu. Well, it's just, just so funny. Uh, you know, the, the schedule has been somewhat in the move, but uh, but uh, we were not. Uh, after, uh, we're just starting the second course here, and uh, and Tom Zurbichens rose up and said, um, "Sorry, folks, uh, on the NASA charter flight, uh, I'm afraid we have to leave now if we want to catch our flight." So they all left. Uh, they all left for their for their flight. Um, and so there was just a bunch of ESA airspace and uh, three lonely Canadians, and we all bunched together and, uh, and finished our nice meal and wine. It was just a wonderful day. So that was the end of the uh, launch day. Okay, so I'm going to miss the, uh, the next day after. So I'm, I'm uh, going back home. This is on the, uh, on, uh, I managed to find get a flight now. This is on the 27th, but I still don't have my damn PCR test. <laughs> And um, I make phone calls, emails. Of course, nobody answers. This is Christmas. And on the, on the 26th, also, I don't get anything. So uh, then I decide with Dave, uh, we, we're going to we're gonna sleep in Cayenne uh, on, the, on, on, the 20, on the 26th uh, because there was the uh, clinic, the Biosoleil clinic that, that was doing the, 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 the PCR test. There was one in Kourou. And I realized there was one also in in um in Cayenne so and I and it was opening at 6 30. so guess what at 6 30 I was right there uh in in Cayenne uh so I I got there and no worries they uh, they, they realized that probably a typo in my email but they had uh, sent they, they, they had my PCR test and it was negative so I went back to uh was close to the sea and uh um uh, to these pictures uh I was alone uh, uh it was the first time I could see the sun. It's been a week of drizzles and rain, and finally we could see uh, the sun. And so um, and now I realize I can actually go home. So that was a time for uh, a little walk and uh, some uh, most appropriate music. And if you allow me to spread a little bit of Quebec culture, I'm sure Harvey will uh, will know that that one. <laughs>
moment in French Guiana. So eight o'clock, the shops opens. I have uh, just a uh, last minute shopping, a little bit shopping in, in, in uh, Cayenne and uh, off to the airport for leaving. Finally, uh, uh, this time I was going to Martinique and then and Montreal. And um, so that's it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed. I, I'm still on my big high for this, this project. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renee. I'm sure there are questions. Let's uh, either ask questions in the chat or stick up your hand. Indeed, and I quite frankly, I don't know the end of the the the, the, the of that story. So that, that not essentially the solar panel, right? That's what you mean, right? Solar panel, sorry. Yes. The solar yeah. Panel. So again, we knew that the camera would catch the observatory, uh, say goodbye, but never was mentioned that we would see the uh, the solar panel deployed. So it was deployed several minutes ahead of schedule. So somehow that was changed. We haven't got to the bottom of that yet, to be honest. So. I can only guess it was done very safely uh, to to do it, um, but uh, yeah, that was a big surprise. But what a sight, right? <laughs> Actually, we uh, there was a sweet meeting. We have a monthly sweet meeting, and that was discussed. And I, I can actually say something about it because it's out there, and I was actually said by Mike Menzel, Mike Menzel, which is the system engineer uh, on the day of launch, actually did mention that. So it is true. The, the launch was so right on, thanks to Ariane Space, that, uh, yeah, we saved a lot of fuel. In fact, you know, these engineers always put factors of three and everywhere in their calculations. And uh, so it turns out, yes, uh, we're doing pretty well in fuel. So before making an official announcement on this, we're going to wait to doing the L2 insertions, of course, uh, yeah, it should, should be fine. Uh, and then at that, uh, we should hear about that in the next couple of weeks. This will be an, an official uh, statement about that. But um, the official story is that we will gain at least at least 10 years of lifetime. So we were told, and, and that was a big surprise to me uh, to hear that uh, just after launch. Uh, we were told that GRC would have a lifetime in terms of fuel, about 11, maybe 12 years. But now we're talking about easily 20 years and maybe more. So, yes, that's true. I don't know the details, but it's basically a, a small webcam attached to the uh, the the. Uh, the, the 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 rocket basically that's all and then uh, the the last stage basically uh, when the we detached and uh, it was oriented such a way you could see web for about three minutes and this is what uh, what you saw yeah and uh, there was a lot of questions about why do, didn't we have any uh, cameras to see the, the the deployments and that that question has been asked a lot and maybe I will anticipate it and 
of course, it's been uh, considered to do this, but you know what? It is very complicated to do cameras to work at cryogenic temperatures, not to say dangerous that they fail and then break and create debris and whatnot. No. And, you know, there's so many actuators, every single move, you know, a latch, there's a, an actuator, a limit switch that tells you that click has been done. So the vast majority of the hundreds of click were confirmed with limit switch. There's still a few that did not officially click, uh, um, but uh, there's other telemetry telling you that you know the actual action was done, the, the actual latching. Um, I don't know if you watched uh, the last very step when the, the last wing uh, moved in, uh, uh, into, into position. So you first you have to move the motor to move the, uh, the, the wing in place. And then there's uh, four, uh, there's 20 latches that we need to lock the, the thing in place. And, um, and, but for those, uh, there were confirmation that all of them latched properly. So anyway, so yeah, everything went very, very, very smoothly with the, uh, the, the deployment. In terms of science image, we'll have to wait uh, uh, somewhere in June, I think. It's, uh, we have to commission all the instruments, but there will be images done before. And there's, there's been a lot of debate where we're going to show the, the uh, single differential emitted PSF, which uh, maybe for the public, this will be deceiving. But I think there's a way to educate the, the, the public as to, you know, the show for the 18 uh, images, out of focus images. And my guess is that we will certainly show that and that will occur in the next couple of months for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I Aaron, said, as a, there, will, yeah, there will be weekly uh, briefing on the blog about what's going on with the project. And you guys get a lot of details as, as much as I can get myself. Very simply, heaters. So uh, the, the thing is that, of course, when we go to space, uh, yeah, everything, all the air goes out, but there's still a lot of uh, uh, molecules trapped into the, uh, the structure. Uh, water, especially, this is a uh, bipolar molecule, so that's a very sticky molecule, so water gets sticky uh, everywhere. So, uh, so the way to control this is to have a control cool down. We don't let the, the, the telescope cool down uh, passively. Uh, it, it is a heated control. So, and as I said, MIRI is the most sensitive instrument for this. Uh, we want to avoid ice contamination. The ice would be a big killer uh, to, for absorptions. And so we're basically heating up things. We don't, uh, we, 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 we just heat things to a point where we're comfortable that we've removed all the ice and then we let the, uh, the instrument cool down. So it's a very controlled cool down. Uh, the micro shutter, micro shutter array from near spec is also very sensitive to, to contamination. So that one is also one that we're very uh, uh, careful about. Um, for FGS nearest, there's not too much concern um, uh, because we're uh, uh, one to five micron instruments, so we're less sensitive to uh, ice contamination. But what we're more worried about is uh, like NeoCam and near spec is the, the detector. We need to uh, uh, turn on the instrument before the instrument gets cold. So, uh, and this will occur at uh, L plus uh, uh, for 30 days, roughly. So around the 28, we'll, we'll turn on the instrument, but not much will happen. Just turning on the instrument and having telemetry that uh, everything is alive inside. I mean, first of all, we, we had delays because, I mean, this, this was the first time we built this machine, right? Uh, I, sure. Arguably, this is the most complex machines ever built by humanity. And we're sending 1.5 kilometers away from Earth. And so, you know, when you do that the first time, and, and, and it goes for any space qualified technologies, then you need to test these things. And, um, and, uh, and things did not go as smoothly as it could have been when, when the first time we we uh, do, uh, did a vibe test of the uh, sun shield. There were 20 bolts around and it was, turns out to be a human error. There was, the, 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 there was these little bolts that were too small and they, 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 they were made too small because they were, the engineers were afraid that it would gap into the, the sun shield, but the bolts were not engaged enough. Worse, uh, a human error, um, they had forgotten to put a glue. Every single bolt on the observatory 
as a glue to avoid vibrations during on 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 uh, on, on do that. And so that was forgotten. And at, at, after Vime, well, realized there were bolts all over the place. Just that was one year delay and three hundred million dollars. Yeah, that's really sad. But you know, this is we did the tests, and then we realized, uh, you know, we need to fix this. And then later on, we, when we were doing the deployment sequence, uh, there was this cable that got snagged into its pulley, um, and that would have been a single point failure. So by far, the sun shield was the scariest part of this. But I think we did what we had to do uh, to thoroughly test these things, and then at the end, make some compromise. Okay, do we, at some point you have to. Uh, balance, are we going to retest and retest? At some point, you're just doing more damage. So we have to strike the right balance. But it looks like we did the right thing. Quite frankly, I'm really impressed. For, well, first of all, with the launch, that was perfectly right on. But same for the, the deployment. It is really a breathtaking accomplishment to see that all these single step was done uh, almost flawlessly. And again, all that stuff, all these details operations have been rehearsed over three, six uh, LREs, launch rehearsal exercise that uh, was done before to uh, and exercise anomalies. And so the team was really ready to do this. And um, so, yeah, so that gives me very good confidence for the rest of it. So um, tomorrow we're going to start moving the 18 mirrors. So to exercise the motors checking that all the seven actuators on the back are healthy and, and alive. And um, we'll see, but I, I think there's good reason to be confident. And, but you know what, it takes time and money. We have to face the mirrors, right? If we can't face that telescope, it's uh, pretty much useless. Uh, so, um, but, uh, but that one too, I, mean, I have good vibes to not to make a bad pun because um, this thing, this algorithm for phasing the, the mirrors has been done more than a decade, more than a decade ago. And on a, on a, on, on a, uh, a smaller scale model telescope uh, at Ball Aerospace, uh, Scott Acton, which is the engineer who actually devised the wavefront sensor algorithm to do this. And of course, we did test that at Johnson's when the, the whole observatory went a uh, cryogenic test. Not only did we measure the curvature of the, uh, of the mirror, which is fine, there won't be any spheric collaboration in web, I can guarantee that. But also we exercised ourselves to go from an, a, a non-aligned telescope to a fully aligned one. We did that. We did that once at Johnson and it went very well. So, and that was approved that the cryogenic motors were working at, at these temperatures. And, and so um, um, again, have good vibe. Now the, the big questions we have, and there's a lot of questions within the science team is how many iterations we're gonna be doing this. It's, it's not a very simple pro, for those who are familiar with optics, NearCam is the reference sensor. But WIRCAM sit right in the, the center of the, the field of view, but the, the, all the other instruments are on, 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 on the side. And so we need to crack also the wavefront on, 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 on the, on the on, on outside the near camera field of view. And for that, you need the other science instrument. And TFI, well, not sorry, TFI, long way, nearest will be actually crucial to, uh, to do the uh, multi field wavefront sensing uh, uh, measurement. Um, but again, we've done thousands of simulations of these things. And, and, and um, so there's good reason to be confident. But, but to answer shortly your question, that's the big one. Yeah. And right. we're gonna have to wait two months for this one. But I, my hope is that this project will make so much noise and the, it already does. And we, we have to continue to make a lot of noise that uh, yeah. Maybe that's our chance to get our, our next next big mission. Um, you know, yeah, exactly. to come back to my, to my question, you know, uh, we failed basically to try to convince our government somehow, and we are always complaining against CSA. And but uh, it's a very complex problem. But the I think the root of that is to uh, have that more publicly available, more visible to the public and our politicians. And I think uh, uh, it's a good start. And um, you know, all the Canadians are going to be using the uh, the telescope. I mean, every single observation of that telescope will be worth a press release. And, and so, this is our job now to uh, 
to spin that. And uh, hopefully this is how we're going to do it. Okay, thanks. Uh, but I, I can tell you, and you know, our, you know, our red polo was actually quite useful there because this is how Tom Zorbridgen came to me and said, oh, I'm really glad you you you, you came, you know, because I uh, I do I I had, I had not come with Dave. That would there that would not have been any Canadian there. Of course, Lisa Campbell sent a, a video uh, a message, uh, uh, which was very nice, and also the the minister uh, uh, Champagne uh, talked about it, was was nice. But okay. uh, I think it was it was good to have some warm bodies uh, in in Kourou. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't mention it, but on on the. Uh, on the 23rd, on the 24th, uh, I had dinner next to uh, Zorbich and then we talked about as to 2020s and what was the future and uh, the landscape and international partnership. And uh, he asked about, you know, what about Canada? He, 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 he's very pleased with what we've done. And, uh, and um, I think he would be pleased he would, could be part of a, the next big mission. But of course, we have other priorities. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah. No, but I mean, the CSA is so underfunded compared to NASA, as we know. So that, that yeah. if that changed, everything would be easier. And that, as I said before, N Natalie Wallet has has been has been very prominent in the media. So that's that's been fantastic. She's such a good spokesperson. Yeah, I should mention that Natalie has actually uh, uh, paid half of her salary from my contract with CSA. I, I'm the one who pushed for this because uh, very early on I realized that CSA didn't have any outreach officers with uh, really scientific expertise. You, you, when you look at NASA and ESA, all outreach officers are PhDs in, in astronomy. And I, I insisted on that and it took a while to sell that to CSA. Uh, uh, but at the end, they uh, acknowledged to, to have that. So I managed to get Natalie. I, I stole her from the McDonald Institute and now she with, with us at IREX. But, but half her job is to uh, do uh, science combination for GWSC. And that's your, your, your resource for getting press release outs. And so don't hesitate to contact her. Uh, yeah, she's doing an incredible job. Not at L2, and this is so far away. Um, they, I mean, it's micrometeoroids, of course, that, that you can't avoid, but uh, uh, even the probability of that is very, very small. So uh, no, that's the one I'm, I sleep tight on that one. <laughs> I'm more worried about- There's only other science missions at L2, and L2 is a big place, right? It's a big place. And the, the actual JOC orbit is a huge uh, circle around L2. and. Of course, you don't want to be at L2. You'd be in the shadows of the Earth, and that you need solar power, uh, solar, solar, solar power. So it, it's always in, a, in, a, in this big uh, loop around, around L2. Uh, and that's the, the point where you have uh, is the most stable point and they were to, to minimize fuel, right? And that's where, that's where we send other missions there, you know, Planck and Gaia, et cetera. But, you know, L2 is a big place. It's a big, big place. And you're right, yeah. So you don't want to be at that point. So in, in effect, you're actually uh, orbiting it. And regularly, because of the momentum pressure from the sun, we have to uh, unload some momentum, and that's you know part of the uh, the fuel budget uh, over the lifetime. But uh, so far, so good. We're going to be partly, there. Mark's pointing out that WMAP and Planck are no longer there, right? For example, yeah, right. Because <laughs> you leave you leave L two. Um. Any further questions? Oh, you can. As long as we have fuel to correct the orbit, um, uh, because yeah, so I, must... yeah but that, that it's right now. It, it, it's don't quote me. It's not a, an official statement, but it, it, it's around twenty years for now. So that's the fuel. that's the thing that's the that's the thing that is now better because you said yeah. fuel during getting to L2, is yeah. that right? It used to be 11, 12 years, and now it's more like 20. But now, you know, that doesn't mean the observatory will, will, will stay alive that long. We have to worry about the lifetime of the instrument itself. Uh, you know, the, uh, the electronics components uh, have a limited lifetime. And, uh, you know, we delivered our instrument in 2012. Um, Everything works. Of course, we checked, uh, you know, as part of the, the test campaigns, there are always these very CPTs 
comprehensive uh, uh, test campaign uh, to check that everything is working. And so, but you know, there's four size instrument and uh, mode redundancy. Uh, so there's this hope that uh, there will be at least some observing modes uh, in 10, 20, 15, in 15, 20 years, who knows? But we're not there yet. With that, I think uh, we should probably call it a day and thank Rene again for a great presentation and telling us all about his trip and my and pleasure. And, and next time, I'll, his, I hope I can present you some some science results uh, in maybe six months or a little bit more than that. <laughs>